The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. When she was six, we went up to Pikes Peak, and suddenly she started running toward the edge. There was no boundary up there, no guardrail or anything, and reflexively, I yelled out, Stop! Now, why did I do that? Was I trying to uh, steal some wonderful experience from her, or falling over a mountain? I did that because I loved her, and I saw her going in a direction that was going to bring harm to her. Dr. Robert Jeffers explores the time-tested blueprint for a joyful, flourishing life. I want to welcome you to Life Today. And we, we have not only one of the most popular guests we ever have on Life Today, but he's the most popular guest on nearly every network or television program he gets on. And he's really a popular guest at First Baptist Church, Dallas, where they've had some pretty good preachers visit and some pretty good pastors, amazingly. And you know what those that are still around say about him? Never been a First Baptist Church pastor like Robert Jeffers. <laughs> I mean, he can do everything but walk on water. We haven't seen him try that yet. But what he's doing in leadership is amazing. Now, listen to me. This guy's blessed. His church is blessed. His church is a blessing. I've gone with him all over the country to talk to the most powerful people and leaders on the planet. And I watch how he impacts them. And I think he would say, and I do, James. But listen, here's key. We left these 10 incredible, important matters, not suggestions, how to live and love in a world that has lost its way. That's us. But here's why. It is the Ten Commandments. Robert Jeffers, mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffers, <laughs> First Baptist Church pastor, <laughs> thank you for being back on Life Today. Do you even remember how many years ago you started being on Life Today? It was at least 10 years ago. So it's been since you were here. Yes. You didn't come from Wichita Falls because the drive was too far? <laughs> because deal? you would never have to. Oh. I never asked. <laughs> Maybe you were still finding your way, <laughs> but look where you found your way to. I got to ask you this. You grew up in the church. Yeah. Were you shocked that you came back to pastor that church? Honestly, I wasn't. When I was 15 years old, I was called to the ministry and I went to see the pastor, Dr. Criswell, who was there for 50 years. And I told him God had called me to be a pastor. And he said, well, Robert, this is what I want you to do. Now I'm 15. He said, I want you to spend the summer and I want you to work in the missions area, the children's area, the music area. I want you to get to know every square at inch First of Baptist. this place at, okay. at First Baptist House <laughs> because I believe this is all going to be yours one day. How old were you? 15. <laughs> And so he had me kneel with him, and he prayed for me as God led me eventually to become the pastor of the wow. church and that God would bless that's me. Remarkable. So I had a hint that that's what was going to happen. <laughs> Are you loving that place and responsibility right now? I love First Baptist Church. I've been in two other great churches, but there's no church like First Baptist Dallas mm -hmm. because it's a church built not on denomination or tradition. It's built on the Bible. Mm -hmm. 155 years in downtown Dallas, <laughs> standing strong for the Word of God. So I pastor, the, I think, the greatest church in the world. <laughs> well, they think you're the greatest pastor in the world, and we're just not going to waste time arguing with it. All right. <laughs> I want you to take off here. Just start. We've uh, talked about some that you wanted to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, um, do you say that leaving the first one out just starts the whole thing going the wrong way? Well, I, certainly, you know, there's one God, only one God. And, you know, most people think that God is whoever they imagine him to be. They don't worship idols. They don't have, you know, a little statue that they bow down to. So some Christians think, well, I am uh, not guilty of idolatry. Well, idolatry is loving anything or anyone more than you love God. And a lot of people have a false idea of God is. They think God is a sum of my speculations about him. I remember our mutual friend, David Jeremiah, <laughs> told about a lady who came up to him after a sermon and said, Dr. Jeremiah, I just want you to know that the God I serve would never send somebody to hell for not believing in Jesus. And David said, I'm sure he wouldn't because the God you serve doesn't exist. He's the God of your imagination. So when we talk about God, we need to be sure we're worshiping the true God. And that's really what the first two commandments deal with. You said you wanted to talk about the value of God's day. Now we've got 10 here. Here we are. Okay. God's day. 
You know, if there is one thing I could say about this book, The Ten, is uh, this, The Ten reminds us that God gave his laws not to restrict our freedom, but to enhance it, to enhance our joy. And I tell people, I use this illustration, when our daughter Julia, and you've had her on your show here, when she was six, we went up to Pike's Peak and drove up to Pike's Peak, and we were taking pictures there, and suddenly she started running toward the edge. There was no boundary up there, no guardrail or anything, and reflexively, I yelled out, stop, stop. Now, why did I do that? Was I trying to... Uh, steal some wonderful experience from her, a falling over a mountain. I did that because I loved her, and I saw her going in a direction that was going to bring harm to her. Now, that's why God says, don't do this. Don't do this. Do this instead. He's not some cosmic killjoy who's trying to keep us from anything good. He's trying to prevent bad things from coming into our life. And remembering the Sabbath is a good idea. The Sabbath, God said, Jesus said, was not made for God. God made it for our benefit. God knows there's one day a week that we need to take off to refresh and to reflect on him. It's not a bunch about rules, you know. I always got tickled about people who would say, well, you know, we Baptists would say, you can't go to the movies on Sunday. That's what keeping the Sabbath means. Don't go to the movies. My grandparents were Methodist, and I couldn't believe that they went to the movie on Sunday afternoons. I thought they were going to hell, <laughs> but I secretly thought I'd sure like to be a Methodist, uh, you know. But God, it's not about little restrictions like that. It's saying God made us. He knows we need one day a week, which we cease working and refresh ourselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Amen. This one we see totally... Uh basically disobeyed and then we look it looks like we can almost see reason that it might be a fact honor your parents we don't see much of that going on but then if we look a little deeper sometimes we think how would you honor those parents they don't honor god yeah. they don't honor anything in other words Tell us why that's such a big deal. You know, that's interesting. That is the only commandment that has a promise attached to it. And God that's said right. to the Israelites, so that your days may be long in the land in which you dwell. Well, he was talking about a national blessing that comes from honoring parents. And here's why. If you honor, if you teach your children to honor, obey you when they're children, mm -hmm. they will learn respect for other authority figures that come into their life, yeah. whether it's an employer, a school teacher, law enforcement, the government. But if they learn they can disobey their parents, then they'll disobey anyone. For a child, obeying your parents means, honoring them means to obey them. As young adults, when you start your own home, you're not under the authority of your parents, but it's wise to consult them, mm -hmm. to seek their advice. But even people say, how do I do it if my parents are dead? Well, you honor them in how you speak about them. Let's be honest. There are bad things we can choose to remember about our parents. Mm -hmm. They made mistakes just like we do. But to honor them means to speak well of them. It's not that you approve of everything they did, but speak well of them for the good things that they did. We have a mutual friend, um, Probably June, a lot of, a lot June of Hunt. And, uh, June's in our church. She was my youth director growing up when I was listening to you at age 13. But uh, June Hunt tells in her testimony, her dad made some big mistakes and there were some things that were not right there. But she also honors her dad for the good qualities like hard work and other things he instilled in her. And I think that's what it means for us to honor, to choose to remember the good, speak about the good, and forgive the bad. You know, if you start by not honoring them, you're going to dishonor a lot of things that need to be honored, including God. Yes. Really and truly, it all stacks up real fast. All right, let's, let's, let's get this one now. Uh, preserve life. Yeah. Don't that murder. Don't murder. You know, some people uh, use the King James Version, thou shalt not kill, but that doesn't capture it because there is some killing that is sanctified by God. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just wars, capital punishment, that was God's idea. Defending yourself against an intruder, the law spells out you can do that. But murder better captures the idea of premeditating the taking of another life out of anger. We're not to do it. And by the way, that includes suicide, mm -hmm. taking your own life. You have no right to do that. That's God's property. Uh, abortion, euthanasia. 
But by the way, you don't have to do just those things to commit murder. You can kill people other ways when you destroy their reputation. And we see that so much in Christian circles, Sad. just slandering other people without any thought. What you're saying is you deserve to have your reputation slandered, and I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. You're not to do that, the Bible says. All right, you've got uh, many things that pop into your mind. One of the commandments is you wonder how he kind of expresses or deals with it or make, understand, help us understand why that's so important right now. Yeah, well, of course, I, I relate to the pre preserving life. Yes. Right? That means so much to me because, um, you know, life is so precious. That's to, right. It's so precious. We we had our oldest daughter, and then we were told that we would, I wouldn't probably have any more children, so we adopted our son when he was four days old. And then three years later, unbeknownst to us, God gave us Robin. Yes. And you know the preciousness of life. And we watched her take her last breath at 40 from cancer. But what precious 40 years that was. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how young or how old, life is so precious, precious to God. He made us. He made us and gave us the purpose in life. And so that, that purpose and just knowing that, that through prayer too, God's prayer, praying to him is so powerful. And now it seems like that's been taken away from. Yeah. We talked about that a little bit on the other show. And it's just like I see our world now where they don't they don't think parents are capable of taking care of their children the government wants to take That's them right. and use them and destroy the parents basically he wants to take and rob them from their children and that's preciousness of life it's so many areas of that that we need to look at. And, and you all demonstrate that, Betty, in so many ways in this ministry about the value of life. It's not just life in the womb. Some people just only want to focus on that. That's important. That's where it begins. But it's life outside of the womb. What you're doing in uh, helping rescue girls from human trafficking, that's all based on the value of life. Each of yes. those girls has a life that is important to God, that was created by God. Yes, Giving people water, these water wells, that's demonstrating the preciousness of life. You know, we'll never stop abortion, no matter how many laws you pass, if you don't, the mother who has an unwanted child, if she does not realize how precious that life is, and the potential in that life, you won't stop her from taking that life. We have to see life as precious, yes. with indescribable potential. Who would have ever thought that this product of rape could actually bless so many people? My life had potential. My mother didn't want to get pregnant by an alcoholic when she was 40. But look what God can do. Yes. The preciousness of life, please see that, and this is so clear. You wanted to talk about coveting? You know, the last commandment is thou shalt not covet. Now, I read that and I thought to myself, if I were God, I would have arranged them differently. I would have ended with a big, big one, you know, <laughs> adultery, <laughs> murder, theft, thou shalt not. <laughs> thou shalt not covet? That seems a little weak, but I think there's a reason. I think it's a climax, really. Coveting is the basis for every other sin that is prohibited in the Ten Commandments. Why do we murder? Why do we commit adultery? Why do we steal? Why do we do these things? Because we're dissatisfied with what God has given us. You know, the very we're first, really wanting something somebody we want else something, has got. We want something or someone yep, somebody exactly. else has. And that was the basis for the first sin in heaven. Lucifer didn't like his position. He wanted something better, different. He than wanted what God his position. Him. He wanted his. And so I think that's what uh, is the reason for the last commandment. Uh, what's the answer to covetousness? It's contentment. Paul said, I've learned to be content. That word means containment, to be inwardly satisfied. And for a Christian, that satisfaction is through Jesus Christ, remembering that God's given us everything we need to have a happy and joyful life. You know, God told the Israelites when he led them out of Egyptian bondage, it was horrible and describable. He said, I'm going to lead you into a land that flows with milk and honey. It's going to be more fertile, more protective, and it's going to be more magnificent and more beautiful than you could ever imagine. So you need to be very careful. You need to guard your heart that you not let your attraction to something I made to bless you, 
become something that you covet or desire to the point that you make an idol out of it. That attraction becomes a distraction and then it becomes something that holds you captive. And when it holds you captive, then you've lost the very joy and freedom for which I just brought you into the promised land, blessed beyond description. The beautiful things God has made, the things that taste good, uh, require some kind of supernatural moderation and self-control. Everything you're attracted to that takes you away from God, that attraction becomes too often an idol yeah. that takes yeah. away all the joy, blessing, and benefit that God wanted you to have. Everything I made is so magnificently beautiful, you could desire it in an, a, literally an idolatrous way, and that's what's happening. What a powerful book. What a great God to give us these simple directions to have a blessed life that blesses others, and you'll find no greater blessing than blessing others, which is what he even found through what his son went through to bless the whole world with life. That's right. And if there's one thought I'd leave with our audience today, it's this. This book, The Ten Commandments, it's not a list of requirements to get into heaven. We can't keep them well enough to get into heaven. God gave these commandments not for his benefit, but for our, our benefit, benefit. to enhance our happiness. And when you understand what these commands really mean and how they touch every area of life, you experience eternal life now. I've come that you might have life yes. and have it more abundantly. I have, Not everlasting, later, life. I have everlasting life now. That's it right. started here. That's right. And I'm enjoying it. Can you tell I've got some enthusiasm at age? <laughs> <laughs> and you're not supposed to have a voice right now. <laughs> well, I know. And I, I, listen, but let me tell you something. I, I love sports. This girl is a sports fan. I'm going to tell you something. She's a cowboy fan. And I don't know how she's And she says with the Rangers. I don't know how. And the Mavericks. Hey, here's the, okay, I'm a fan too. But I'm going to tell you something. I've never been so excited in my life as I am about seeing his vision mm -hmm. fulfilled through his family. I'm so excited at 80. I, I asked the friend that helped me more than anybody, Dudley Hall, the other day at lunch. I said, Dudley, you've known me 50 years. Okay, you ministered to me when I had the greatest experience of deliverance in the Lord. And I said, Dudley, I'll ask you something. Have you ever seen me more excited and have more joy in my life? Tell me the truth. Never in 50 years. I have more joy. I have more peace. I have more excitement. I have more direction. I'm touching more lives now than I ever have. And they're going out and touching more lives than you could ever imagine. Imagine me having an impact on somebody because I'm so excited about the father's desire and the father's dream. Do you think at 80 I've gone wacky? No, I think as we said off camera, you're just getting going now. You know, <laughs> Moses' second act in life started when he was 80. That's I didn't when know he was 80. Him. Yeah, he was 80. So. Got any predictions about the rest of his deal? He, he tells me it's going to be unbelievable. You got any little advice you can give me? Or it, it, you just, to... just don't hit that rock like he did. You'll be okay. No, sir, but I'm going to do it exactly how he says do it. Hey, folks, it's in the bookstores. You love this guy before I introduced him. So many people do, it's unbelievable. Please get the book, but I tell you what, you help us put God's arms around girls and many times boys that are being trafficked sexually, we'll send it to you to say thanks. And by the way, because of what we've done with that border, do you realize that insanity is reigning in a lot of places of leadership because these weren't really important to them? Would you help us rescue, and by the way, we're working real hard to rescue them here, but would you help us set sexually trafficked girls in the sex capital of the world and we're there and in all the other countries in Asia and other places rescuing kids that are taken into sexual trafficking. I want you to listen to one of our partners. He's in Asia. Listen to what he says because you make these great things happen. God's love through you. Thank you for not turning away. Look at the real need and meet that need with his love. Watch. We couldn't imagine the extent of the evil 
that allowed four-year-olds to be trafficked and sexually abused by men coming from all over the world. We knew we needed to do more. One day our phone rang and it was a young girl trapped in a brothel calling for us to help. So we gave the information to this other organization, but we had to wait three days for them to get into position to do a raid. But it was tipped off and none of the girls were rescued and now they were moved to a new brothel and we didn't know where they were or how to get them out. We would never let this happen again. So we partnered with the government and started our own SWAT team. Everything turned around. So instead of raids being tipped off, there was hardly ever a raid that wasn't successful. And now that girl that made the phone call, she's not only rescued, she's not only healed, but today she's a social worker of our SWAT team. And when a rescue happens, the first person those girls see is her. She's also testified against a brothel owner. All the girls were rescued, the brothel was shut down, and no girls are being hurt there again. So much incredible work has been done through the power of Christ, but there's still so much more to do. There are girls trapped in brothels. We know where they are and we know how to get them out, but we can't do it alone. We need your help. Together, we can defeat the greatest evil of our lifetime. All right, we've been there. We've been in the sex capital. We're told we perhaps built the biggest rescue center in the world which is, we refer to as Destiny House. But that's just one place, that was another place. What do, you, what do you want our viewers to hear? Because Betty, you and I have seen these precious girls. Yeah, we have. And our heart breaks for the men and the people that would use those girls. Mm -hmm. Not only sell them, but go and buy them. It breaks my heart, God set us free. You know, what James, you sometimes it might just be one girl at a time. That one child is worth all that we can give to help rescue them. They got a phone call from one little girl and they could not locate her. They kept moving her around. Finally, she was set free. Can you imagine what that day would be like for these children to know that they've been captive for so long and then they're set free? How wonderful. We know in our own hearts when we've been captive in our own spirits and God sets us free. What a joyful day that is. Join with us. Let's set these children free. That's every mission area in the world because that's important to secure future for children all over the world. They know that. But we teach them to sing praises. And we used to could show you hundreds of them, even thousands of them singing. <laughs> And the mission workers told us, you can't show that because they're finding them by capturing their pictures and they're capturing them on the street or when they're shopping with somebody, they recognize them and took them back. So you can't show their faces anymore. But if you could see their faces, the glory of God's all over. And then we taught them how to make a living and how to share life. I mean, this outreach is as pure a work of Jesus and the church as anything on planet earth. Would you right now, we have a $320,000 matching gift by people who say we care so much about it. Would you go right now to the phone? Would you take your bank card? Would you make a $128 gift? That's what it takes to rescue and to begin the restoration process. If you give 128 now, it rescues two. 1,280 gets 10, now it's 20. 20, would you do that? There's a level at which you can help Father, help everyone watching to say, God, how many can I help rescue? I know whatever I give will be doubled. Help them to do it, please, in Jesus' name, would you? Would you go get your bank card, use it like a check, go online or dial that number and you make the gift of life and freedom that God puts on your heart. We have some beautiful gifts for you. Please, make that call. Touch someone with God's love. Change their life. Thank you. Innocent children and young people longing to be loved and cared for are being abducted and sold at the hands of violent predators forced into the evil industry of human trafficking. 
Through Mission Rescue Life, you can reach out to warn children who are at risk for sex trafficking, rescue those already enslaved, and restore young lives and give them a future. With a generous $320,000 matching gift, now your gift of $128 to help reach, rescue, or restore one child can be doubled to help two children. Your $64 gift will be matched to help save one child from the horrors of human trafficking. And a $32 Mission Rescue gift will be doubled to $64. With your gift today, we'll send you Declare. This beautifully designed 31-day devotional reveals 31 names of God from Scripture and gives insight to the character, grace, and depth of God's love for you. With your gift of $128 or more, you'll receive the Gospels book set. This special edition collection of the four Gospels in the classic King James Version includes journaling space opposite each page of Scripture so you can reflect as you read, the perfect companion for your daily time with God. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,280, which will now help save 20 children, and you may request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Consider the Birds. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Betty, I'm believing for a supernatural response. Let me tell you something. This is real important. You help us rescue some of those precious girls, we'll send it to you to say thanks, and I know Doc will love that. Let me tell you something. You know I love this man. He's been listening to me since... He said he started listening when he turned 13, First Baptist. And I don't remember how old I was, but, you know, I'm I'm a close to... You're 13 20. years old. How much older? 13. 13 years old. Yeah. Anyway, I love this guy. You love him. Get this book because God wrote these to benefit you, not limit you to enhance everything that really should matter and does matter. He knows what matters. He's the one that can deliver dreams beyond your greatest. He loves you. Dr. Jeffers, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We've been friends a long time. Long time. And it's been a wonderful journey, and I think it's getting better. It is. It's just starting. You're 80. Yeah. You've got at least 50 more years to go. <laughs> we love you. Thanks for helping us rescue those who've been trafficked. Bless you. When planning your future, keep their future in mind. Contact Life Planning Services today. If someone were to stand behind me in that moment and take my photo, my feet would have been off the ground. Ben Fuller, next week. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.